this is my second time recording this exact video. I recorded this last night. I got really frustrated with my lights, so we just got new lights. A lot of you already know. Not that this is like a huge deal to everyone, but this really bothers me. So, I just wanted to say for future reference, and you'll probably hear me say this again, just if you ever catch the glare anywhere on my face besides where the highlighter is, it's not oil, it's just the light reflecting off of my face. It's a lot better than it was yesterday. It looked like I was just sweating. Hey guys, what's up? Today we are talking about another case video, or... I don't really know how to refer to these. Some of them are unsolved mysteries, some of them are missing persons, but my first one, the last one that I did before this one, um, it wasn't missing persons or unsolved case according to all the information and what police had found. So I just call them case videos. I don't really know how else to refer to them. Also, I just wanted to remind you guys that I do leave a disclaimer in the description just regarding these videos. I don't want to have to repeat myself every time, but that will always be there. And just know that I try and get the best information I can out to you guys. And I do my best to be respectful, so please stay respectful in the comments to others, to me, to the families and friends of the people that we talk about in these cases. This one was originally the one I was going to cover first before I put up my Kanika Jenkins video. This case is very strange, to say the least. It's pretty old by now, it's 25 or 30 years old, although we still just don't have any answers whatsoever. So bear with me, you guys, this case kind of goes back and forth, but I will tell you guys that you're going to be very frustrated with this case. So this case is about the Springfield Three, which are Susie Streeter, who is 19 years old, Stacy McCall, who is 18 years old, and Susie's mother, Cheryl Levitt, who is 47 years old. So Susie and Stacy were last reported seen on June 7th, 1992. They had just graduated high school and that night they were going to go to a few different graduation parties to celebrate. So Susie and Stacy were last reported seen around 2 a.m. at the last of the graduation parties they were attending. They were originally going to sleep over at their friend Janelle's house, but they decided that it was too crowded there, so they went back to Susie's house for the night. Police estimate that the girls arrived back to the house around 2.15 a.m. because all of their cars got there as well as some other things that we will get into later. So Stacy had called her mom to let her know where she was sleeping and she told her mom that she would call her in the morning before they planned to meet back up with friends and go to a water park for the day. Cheryl was also heard from just a few hours before at 11.15 p.m. when she was on the phone with one of her friends. So the following morning, the girls never showed back up at Janelle's house, so after a few phone calls to the girls with no answer, she decided to take her boyfriend and around 9 a.m. they went back to Susie's house to look for them. I'm not sure who found what. I've heard that Janelle was the original one to go through the house and find some odd things, but I've also heard that Stacy's mother Janice was the one who originally went inside. So I'm just gonna let you guys know that Stacy's mother did try and call her a couple of times and as well was worried when she didn't get any answers So she also stopped by the house. I'm not sure where the timeline adds up there So we're just gonna get into the rest of the information, but one of these three people either Janelle and her boyfriend or Janice originally found the house in the state that it was in but later more family and friends came to the house and police estimated that around 10 to 20 people had gone through the house before they even got there. Upon arrival, they would find that the porch light had been shattered, not the light bulb, but the glass around it. So there was glass on the porch and the front door was unlocked. So they went inside to start looking for the girls and they found that the TV was on. It was on like static so it looked like maybe a movie had just ended. There were makeup wipes in the garbage in the bathroom, so they had assumed that the girls had already gotten ready for bed. Stacy's mother found her clothes folded up down in Susie's room. The only things that she said were missing was her pajama shirt, I believe, and her underwear. But all of the clothes that she had been wearing and some jewelry were all folded nicely on top of that. The family dog was left home and also they found all three women's purses lined up. So, already, a lot of very bizarre things. All of their belongings seemed to be there. And I've heard different things about this detail as well. I'm not sure how important it is, but I just wanted to kind of add that in just in case, is that I've heard that police had said that the bed didn't look slept in, but then the bed also looked slept in. So I'm not sure if one bed was slept in and the other one wasn't. 
because I've heard both things about Cheryl's bed and normally you wouldn't think that this is a big deal but it just kind of seems a little weird if she hadn't slept in her bed at 2 a.m. but it also seems a little weird if she had gotten up and some for some reason made her bed super early. Immediately things were already standing out to friends and family so Susie's best friend at the time, her name was Nigel, I believe that's how she pronounces it. She was actually interviewed about everything that happened and she stated some things that were pretty weird. She stated that Susie is very much a creature of habit. She believes she was almost at the point of OCD and she says that in particular one of the things that she would tease Susie about is where she always parked her car. So I will try and add in a picture but if you look at Susie and Cheryl's house, they have like a round driveway in front of the house and then they also have a little driveway off to the side where there's like a little carport and Nigel says that Susie always parked her car in the carport. It looks like it can fit two cars because if you look at where the women's cars were when people showed up the next day, Cheryl's car was already parked under there so if she always parked her car in the carport I would assume both of them can fit under there. So right off the bat Nigel thought that was weird and so her first thought was was there somebody already there? Is that the reason she didn't park where she always parks because otherwise to her it just did not make sense? So we'll get into that later with the theories but I wanted to throw that in there because that's very strange. They also noticed that Stacy, who struggled with migraines had not taken her medication and Cheryl who is a well-known chain smoker, left her cigarettes in her purse and they noticed, I believe Stacy's mom was the one who found it, but she noticed that there was a $900 check in Cheryl's purse, so it must not have been gone through. She doesn't understand why if somebody had broken into the house, they wouldn't have taken that much money. They wouldn't have, there was no personal belongings missing. And also I did forget to add this, there was zero signs of struggle in, inside the house other than the shattered glass and the door being unlocked. Everything was perfectly in place. Everything looked normal. So everything just right off the bat is very, something is very wrong here. But originally, they didn't think to call the police. Stacy's mother said that calling the police is for emergencies, and she genuinely thought that the girls were going to come back in the door any second. So everybody who stopped by the house was just kind of waiting for them to come back, and in the meantime, they were cleaning things. They were emptying ashtrays, they were cleaning dishes and coffee mugs that were sitting on the counters. Um, the glass that was on the porch had been swept up. Somebody thought that Cheryl would be upset if she saw that, so they swept it up and put it in a garbage can across the street. I believe it was later pulled for evidence, but I don't think anything was found of it. That is probably one of the things where I was saying that this case is kind of heart-wrenching because they were genuinely trying to help and they didn't know at the time that this was evidence, like very important evidence that could have led them to something. And essentially it was destroyed. So on top of that, while they were in the home, they received a phone call they didn't pick it up. I've heard that they thought it would be the girls, so it doesn't make sense to me why they wouldn't pick it up, but it went to voicemail, and it was a man's voice who was making very lewd sexual comments. They, Stacy's mother did say that she just thought it was a prank call, and so the voicemail was erased. I believe they thought this even more because later police stated that they didn't think that this call was related to some prank calls that Janelle had been receiving. So it kind of makes sense that they thought this was a prank call, although police do believe that that voicemail could have contained a clue as to where the women were. And again, I already stated that police weren't originally called, so police didn't even show up until about 10 hours after people had shown up that morning. So on December 31st, 1992, a man called into the America's Most Wanted hotline and claimed to have information about the women's disappearances, but when the operator attempted to link the call up with some investigators, the call was disconnected. So jumping back to that morning, June 7th, at around 2 a.m. is when the girls were last seen. Then later, they received a tip saying that somebody had spotted Susie in a green van around 6.30 in the morning. They said that she looked very scared and that they could hear a man yelling, and according to the police interview, they said it was something along the lines of keep driving if you know what's good for you. Um, it looked like she maybe was crying. Police had stopped a bunch of different green vans to kind of try and investigate, see if there's anything going on. They even parked a green van in front of their station to see if it would maybe jog somebody's memory and they could get information. But unfortunately, this led to a dead end. That is 
the information. That is what everybody is going off of. That is all they found. <sighs> One of the most frustrating things about this case for me is that I think with all of the tips, and we are going to get into this, believe me, there's a lot to be known. But I think with all of the tips and everything we've investigated and the people that they've talked to, I truly, like, in my gut believe that one of those things is exactly what happened to these girls, but they just don't have enough information. I wouldn't be able to say which one of these things or which one of these people. That makes it even more frustrating when you, I just, I just truly, truly believe that they had, they were just so close to solving this and weren't able to do it and that's not at any fault of theirs i really believe that the police in this case have done a lot whatever happened whoever did it their tracks were covered extremely well getting into the people that are around this case we are going to start with and this is going to kind of go back and forth again i guess we will start with kathy baird who was interviewed i would quickly like to add here that it's been said that she got some of her tips from psychics not that i don't believe in them but i also but i also don't know how credible that would be in a crime investigation and I've also heard that she was a well-known attention seeker and this is kind of, it's kind of hard. Some of her things that she says seems credible, but then some of it kind of goes towards that attention seeker because of the way that her interview went and we will get into that. So I believe she was a reporter and I believe that's why she started looking into this case. So Kathy received a tip that the women's bodies were buried underneath the parking garage of a hospital. This is, it can go a few different ways. So. Basically, they brought in a mechanical engineer. His name was Rick Norland and he brought in this device. It's a ground penetrating radar that could basically search through the concrete and tell him if there were any grave sites or anything underneath this concrete. Okay, he said he found three anomalies roughly the same size that he said were consistent with a grave site location. Two of the anomalies were parallel and the other one was perpendicular. So the other one was just like a little bit farther away. First of all, what? She received a tip supposedly from a psychic, but it still led to something. This is so frustrating. Police say that the timeline does not add up because the construction for this parking lot started about a year after the women went missing. And so basically if they wanted to start construction, especially because this is for a hospital, rules are followed. So if they needed to start construction there, they would have basically just had to excavate the area and dig everything up. So if there were any bodies or anything underneath the ground, it would have been unearthed and they would have already found it. That being said, there's still three somethings under the ground. There's still three I mean, you could say that the timeline doesn't add up all you want, but there's still something under the ground that clearly they had found. So something is still not right. Um, it's a little disturbing to know that that's there, but without any real cause to believe that they would be there because they don't believe the timeline adds up. She got her tip from a psychic. It's just going to cost too much money. They aren't able to dig it up. So unfortunately, they never looked further into that. I wish that they would have. I believe that there's something under there, whether it's connected to this case or not. I don't know how else they would have found something. Continuing with Kathy, which is a very frustrating piece of this case, she was interviewed on Crime Watch. Is that what it's called? Crime Watch or Crime Time? Something like that. Lots and lots and lots of people have heard about this show, watched this show, and she agreed to an interview with them along with a lot of the family members because she claims to have information about it. So, and I will try and link this down below for you guys, but if you watch the interview, she's talking about this information. She's talking about how she got involved and what she did with the engineer that she brought to the hospital building to try and find things. But then at a certain point, she refuses to answer any more questions. She won't talk about it. They asked if if she knew what happened and she claims that she did. She claims that they were killed before morning and she states that Stacy was not the target. So we'll get into this again a little bit later because I'm trying not to jump around too much. I'm trying to stick with one person. But Stacy not being the target is weird because that's one of the things that police and other people 
believe was that she was the target and I will explain later. So it's weird that she says that Stacy was not the target and then they asked her what she thought the motive was and she said she wasn't going to talk about it. So at that point she wouldn't answer anything else and the lady interviewing her as well as some people behind the camera, they were upset to say the least and they kind of like got on her about it they were kind of i don't know how to word it hassling her interrogating her about it and saying well why are you on live television right now like national television but you're not going to give us the information that you supposedly have so she tries to kind of defend herself and she's like oh i'm sorry that you don't think i'm giving you the information that you want but i'm afraid for my safety and she goes to say that she has been boxed in by cars and somebody had asked her if she was Kathy Baird and she said yes and they said, hold on, I'm gonna quote. They said, the people I work for make people like you disappear too. And she also states that she was advised to leave the case alone but she won't name who was threatening her. So, you guys, thoughts on this already and I don't want to discredit too much because I'm not closely involved with this case. If she's afraid for her safety, truly she, she could be, but if you were advised to leave this case alone and you still agreed to come onto national television when you claim to have been threatened to your face for being involved with this case and you won't give information after a certain point, but you're still on national television talking about it, even though you are specifically advised to leave this case alone. If you're afraid for your safety, you don't go onto national television. That's how that works. Anybody afraid for their safety wouldn't be like, yeah, that sounds like a good idea. She says that she won't leave this case alone until the family gets answers that she claims to have. So that's another thing that's like, are you serious? That being said, my thoughts looking deeper into this is well here's the information that was already recorded because you can see just like a clip of the engineer in the hospital parking lot so if that was already released maybe she didn't feel so scared to talk about that because everybody already knew about that my thought process is maybe she she stopped answering after they asked her what the motive was so maybe that is the key piece to this investigation and once again there's more people surrounding this case and we will get into that afterwards but I can see the motivation behind these disappearances being the piece that the police need to solve this case and if she really does know then maybe the other information wasn't the important piece it's the motivation behind it and why it happened and if she does know and that's the piece that would get somebody caught for these disappearances then that would make sense as to why she won't talk about it anymore and why she's scared for her safety if that's the key piece maybe she wasn't so scared if she only talked about a certain like certain topics but at the same time you're still on national television you still live in this town you have your full name you're showing your face like it's not anonymous at all and I don't feel like it would be that hard to find her if somebody really wanted to, especially if she really had already received threats. I don't want to discredit, you know, I'm kind of trying to like spread the fact that that is very weird, but also not discredit to keep things respectful because I really don't know if she's telling the truth and what actually happened if she is. As far as Kathy goes, I believe that's it, but we're going to move on to the next person who is Robert Craig Cox and this is another very frustrating, very frustrating thing with this case. Cox is a highly trained army ranger and he was once even named Soldier of the Year. He was convicted and sentenced to death for the murder of 19 year old Sharon Zellers in Florida. Later that was reversed and he was actually handed over to authorities all the way over in California. And I would like you guys to keep the age in mind and it goes with the age of Susie and Stacy. He had also already served nine years. I don't have I don't have a timeline for when he served those nine years, but he did serve nine years for the abduction of two women. But there's more. You would already think this is suspicious. The murder of one young girl, the abduction of two others. Obviously, he's already abducted multiple people at one time. He's highly trained ranger. He knows what he's doing. He actually lived in Springfield in 1992, and he moved there just a few weeks before the women disappeared. On top of that, 
he worked at the same dealership that Stacy's dad worked at. Guess what? There's more. So he was later arrested for aggravated assault in Texas and was interviewed about this case and he claims to know exactly what happened to these women and exactly where they're buried and he refuses to give up this information until his mother passes away. Another person claiming to know exactly what happened who already has a criminal history, who worked where Stacy's dad worked and lived in this town during this time that they went missing. That was like an almost confession, except he didn't give any actual information, just says that he knows what happened, but that doesn't mean that he was involved. So police, their hands are tied. They can't do anything about this. Police say that he was never ruled out. They can't go any further with his lead until they have more information, but he was never ruled out as being a part of this. Although he was given an alibi by his girlfriend at the time of the disappearance, who claimed that they were at church that night. And later when he was arrested in Texas, she went back to police and she completely changed her story. I don't know if she said that he forced her to say it or if she said that she actually just had no idea where he was, but she did say something completely opposite of what she originally told police, which is weird to me because if she changed her story, maybe he was threatening her. Why would she wait until he was arrested? That alibi was taken away. So we don't know where he was the night of the disappearance at this point. So we are gonna talk about one more person that's potentially involved in this case, and that is Susie's boyfriend at the time. So she was dating a well-known bad boy who was involved in some grave robbing gangs and had actually been caught sneaking into a mausoleum and stealing some gold teeth from a skull. I have heard that Susie was actually the one who turned him in for this. When she found out what he was doing, she broke up with him and then supposedly turned him in for stealing the gold teeth. And they had a court date coming up and she said that she would testify against them. And of course, that court date was a couple of months after the girls went missing. That's all the information I have on that. So obviously, the first theory would be that they're involved, that the grave robbing gang or Susie's boyfriend was involved hoping to keep her quiet. Maybe she was just the original target and Stacy and Cheryl just happened to be there. I could see this one happening. They don't have any further proof on this obviously because we have no information or we have no answers on this case. So far it seems to me that it's possible that either Stacy was the target or that Susie was the target. We don't really have any information on why Cheryl would have been the target. They were originally planning on being at somebody else's house and last minute decided to go to Susie's. So if one of the two was the target, they just happened to go back to Cheryl's house and she was home and it's really unfortunate. But personally, I don't believe she was a target. Another theory is that they were involved with a satanic cult, at least Susie. The officer visits the Clay residence to follow up. He observes some strange items in the house, a poster with a large circle, candles, and an animal skull. Some to speculate that, you know, there had been some type of maybe a ritual. That is the only information I've heard as far as this theory goes, but they did think that was very weird, especially considering who she was dating and the kind of stuff that they got into. So they're not really sure why she was looking into that. A lot of people think that the women were buried under that parking lot at the hospital, but with the supposed timeline not adding up and whatever else, they think that it could have been some sort of foul play by the people who worked on that construction, so by one of the construction workers that somehow snuck the bodies in right before they put the concrete down. But I'm not sure which way to go because I did see a lot of debunking on this theory that if you bring in a truck with cement, you have a certain period of time to use it and somebody would have seen you if you'd brought three different bodies back and like if you had them in your car or something, not to kind of like dehumanize the situation. But if somebody was bringing the bodies, one person wouldn't have been able to carry all the bodies, obviously. It's, it's already gonna be hard just to carry one body, but then to dig it up, bury each body, and the period of time that this truck was coming and was there to hurry and lay down the cement before it was all trash basically because if you don't use it in that certain period of time it's just waste it can't it can't be used i have no idea what it takes to be in construction i've also heard that there would be like everybody would be in place already so everybody who's working that day to try and help do this would already be there so how would you get the bodies there 
before everybody's in place but if I just feel like there's such a perfect period of time and this could be debunked somewhere as well but I just feel like after everything was excavated but before construction was started there's that period of time where you're waiting on the cement and overnight when you know that the cement's going to be there the next day people aren't going to be watching this property the whole night so it's easy to come in the middle of the night hurry and bury these bodies that are there and the next morning everybody's in place everybody's basically helping to cover these bodies up and nobody knows but the other thing that people have said about this is that if there was something buried underground it would have messed up the structure of the building over time and there's engineers who apparently come out every year to check on this to make sure it's not going to collapse and they would have noticed something weird in the structure that was messed up because there's something buried under there again i don't know much about this but at the same time somebody did find three I don't even- anomalies? Somebody did find something under the ground, but other people are like, well, they would have already noticed. But they found something, so I don't really know how to explain that. That's just confusing to me. Police have also said that they got tips about alien abductions and sex trafficking. So, alien abduction is a lot less likely than sex trafficking, so... A lot of people do think that that's possible. This one is a little strange to me just because usually you don't take somebody from their house. They usually take people by opportunity, by walking at night or not paying attention. But the women had arrived home. They found evidence inside, their vehicles were in the driveway, their belongings, their purse. I don't see that it's very common that multiple women were taken. And with the surrounding circumstances, with it seeming like this is very likely a personal motive, that one just doesn't seem likely to me. Of course, still a possibility, but that just feels like a lot of work. And then on top of that, there was no signs of struggle, nothing personal or anything worth value, like nothing was missing from the house. And if you're going in there for sex trafficking, that's obviously a very specific reason. But if it's not personal to these women, I feel like if they found something in the house that was of value, they might have also taken that with them because money um, and nothing was missing. So that just kind of leads me to believe even more that there was a very specific reason they targeted these women in this house. So, of course, the theory that Robert Cox was involved is a big one. They think that he might have fallen in love or taken a liking to Stacy since he worked at the dealership with her dad and became her stalker and targeted Stacy but the other two were collateral or maybe he targeted Stacy but also took a liking to Susie and Cheryl happened to be collateral didn't want to leave any witnesses to anything so we don't really have any more information other than he just seems to be linked to this case in multiple ways and we can't prove it and that is so beyond frustrating Another one is that people believe it could have been somebody they knew to get inside the house and that's why there was no signs of struggle. I am just kind of unsure with people randomly showing up because with Susie's friend Nigel who thought about the possibility that somebody was already there since she didn't park in her normal spot, maybe somebody was parked there. So maybe somebody was already at the house and maybe it was a car that she recognized and so it didn't really set off any red flags, she just went in like normal. but. Again, if that was the thing that happened, they had apparently already gotten ready for bed as they found the makeup wipes. So if they were and they already went to bed, did this person just sleep over? Like, I'm just kind of trying to think about who or why somebody would be at the house that late. And if they already went to bed, that means that person would have had to still be there. But of course, they also think that somebody could have used a ruse to get inside. So maybe there's some sort of person in uniform um, that is trustworthy for some reason that they let inside the house but that also doesn't really make sense because it just doesn't make sense to me that that wouldn't have set red flags off to them that they would have let somebody inside the house originally maybe you would have trusted somebody but at three o'clock in the morning or whatever time it was early early in the morning i don't see them just easily letting somebody inside the house for that reason if somebody was of service and used that ruse to get inside. My thoughts are that if somebody attempted to use a ruse and like I said they didn't fall for it, the only sign of struggle was the glass that was broken on the porch so maybe if they tried to shut the door on this person and lock it and somehow something was bumped into the porch light where the glass shattered and that's why the door was unlocked because this person was able to push past 
before they were able to close the door and kind of get in and maybe held them at gunpoint so that they were just so terrified that they didn't fight back because otherwise why was there no sign of struggle unless they were so spooked and caught off guard that they didn't know what to do so they just kind of did what this person asked. That is pretty much the end of these theories. That's, that's all I have. The last thing that I wanted to add is that there is a $42,000 reward. I'm not sure if that is still being offered, but it was offered at some point. I wish that I knew if it was still being offered, but I did read that there is a $42,000 reward to find all of these women. And I will leave a number down below in the description box. There's a number you can call, or if you go to crimewatchdaily.com, which I will also link in the description, they have some sort of tip line and you can be anonymous, but if you know anything, just spread the word, spread the video, however you want to do it, but especially if you live in this area, because as every video and pretty much every type of case video that you watch, whether it's from me or not, a lot of people will tell you somebody knows something and somebody's not coming forward. If not, multiple people know something and nobody's saying anything about it, so spread the word, spread this story, and let's just hope that these families and these friends can get the closure they deserve after 25 or 30 years. Genuinely, I can't imagine what kind of suffering that would cause just to think that after all this time, there's nothing, but people still remember and people are still accepting tips for this case and they would really like to solve it. I'm gonna end this video on a little bit lighter of a note. It's still important to be respectful and take a moment for these families, but these cases can get very serious and I'm just going to start doing my intros and outros the way that I normally would, um, which would be if you like this video or just my channel in general, give it a thumbs up, subscribe, join the family. I'm probably going to be doing more of these videos that's not all my channel is about. I do other things as well, but I would like to do more of these types of videos. So if you'd like to see more, whatever you're subscribed to me for, it's great, it's fine. But join the family, I love the support. I put a lot of work into these videos, no matter what kind of video I do, I put a lot of work into it. Of course, the support is always appreciated. My social media will be in the description if you want to follow me elsewhere. Leave in the comments for sure if you guys have any other weird, bizarre cases to look into. I'm starting to keep a list of the ones that I want to look into. Oh, you can also comment below what you think happened, what you've heard if I missed them. All right guys, that's all I have for you. That's all I have to say. I've said my piece. Thanks so much for watching and we'll see you next week. Bye guys.